visible in the back of some of the photographs. If you enhance them and manipulate them, you can see these structures. Yeah, I've seen them. I've seen the photographs that uh, Mike, uh, Richard Hoagland has produced as evidence for this, and they're quite persuasive. And he argues it very strongly. He makes a very strong case for saying that the moon did not now. There's no, nothing, no structures there now, but there are photographs. Once they got there, they photographed the structures, and they were ancient, huge, made of glass and steel. And I think what he saw is what I pointed out in the background of that globe. It was the structure of the warehouse in which the photographs were taken. Now, that's not being considered, and it's a bit ludicrous, but there's more and more convincing evidence coming out as people are investigating some of the simulation photographs which are known to have been taken, there's no secret about it, and matching them up with lunar photographs and saying, look, the background is the same. There are lights, there are girders, there are lines in there. That may be what Richard Hoagland is, is saying. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's certainly worth looking at. And he makes a very strong case. Marcus, do you want to say something about the Ed Mitchell claims? Ed Mitchell, well, Ed Mitchell of course, was uh, one of the astronauts who's claiming that they did find evidence of ETs on the moon. Oh. This is an astronaut. Have you got anything to say about that? Well, uh, yes, it goes... Um, there's a famous story about um, Neil Armstrong whose reported conversation to Houston was censored, for want of a better word. And the conversation goes something like this. Houston, which is what you call mission control. Houston, they're big. They're looking at us. They're over the ridge. My God, their technology, they could destroy us. Words to that effect. I, he's looking at UFOs, watching them on the moon, and compared to them, the aircraft is puny and insignificant. That's the story. Ed Mitchell says similar things, that this ET is out there, <clears throat> but we're not allowed to talk about it because it would disturb too many people to consider that we're not alone. He's a man who spent, Ed Mitchell has spent his life um, researching that type of consciousness. Because the actual recording of Ed Mitchell's conversations with Houston, Neil Armstrong's conversations, don't actually exist in the transcripts, I can't give very much credence to it. You can only go on the evidence. It would be great if there was ET. Wonderful. But there's no evidence for it. There's nothing which can be supported. It's a, for, it's a brilliant form of disinformation. By saying that Neil Armstrong said he saw them on the moon, it makes you immediately believe you must have been there to see them. So it confirms NASA's whole story. No matter how much disinformation they make, you know, who's going to believe ET? A lot of people go along with that and say, yeah, if Neil Armstrong saw it, I've got to believe him. There are various other stories about Neil Armstrong, which are far too rude to tell. But no, I won't. But do watch out for the disinformation the things that you want to believe, and you think they are covering them up. You know, they're, they're usually cocking them up rather than covering them up. They usually make mistakes and try to cover their backs. That's why I try to stick to the photographs and look at the evidence from the photographs because they're irrefutable. These are signed NASA. So things like that, the, the story of Ed Mitchell, the story of Neil Armstrong, they're very plausible, but I can't give much credence. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, looking at some of the history of conspiracy theories, and I think there's something on television at the moment, actually, it's like, what's happened recently is that conspiracy theories happened quite soon after. So the 9-11, you know, the day for the things that happened. But it seems to the is that things didn't have places that were secure in the 80s. And I'm just wondering why that came out at the time, because it's such a huge thing to have in the history. You know, yeah. why, why not it happen at the time or did it? Or I think it's, it, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a good point you make that after 9-11 the conspiracy theories came out very rapidly. Yeah. Mainly because more people had access to the information through the internet, through television. If you go back to Apollo, you know, A, how many people were alive when it happened? You know, Muggins here is well, one of them. Um, 
we didn't have access to that sort of information. We wanted to believe it. We, it was a much more innocent time. Also, look at the timing, the, the context of Apollo. Kennedy, this great charismatic leader, shot a few years earlier. He'd made the challenge that had to be fulfilled. It was almost a sort of Arthurian legend that it had to be fulfilled, no matter what the cost. Now, it cost a lot of money, Apollo, $40 billion in 1960s money. It's about $200, $200 billion today's money, or more. So it was a big... And then they had a war to fight as well, while we're doing that at the moment. So there was a lot riding on it. Apollo was the distraction. Apollo was the, the feel-good. You've got the Vietnam War, you've got the, the Cold War, you've got the Russians being nasty. So nobody actually wanted to disprove it. Nobody actually wanted to come along and say, no, it couldn't possibly have happened. Because... I, I first heard of them in the, basically the early 90s. Now, it may have happened before that. David Percy was the first person I heard discussing it. Uh, he published his book, Dark Moon, uh, in 1999. He'd been writing it for about eight years before that. And he produced the, the DVD, What Happened on the Moon, which is a four-hour documentary about the whole thing, looking at incredible detail at the evidence. Then other authors have come along. There's a German author, Gerhard uh, Wisniewski. His book, uh, One Small Step, question mark, uh, is from a German perspective, and he actually went over and interviewed a lot of people in America uh, on both sides. There's Ralph René, who wrote the book um, NASA Moon and America. That was early 90s as well. The first person was probably... Um, oh, God, his name's gone. Casing. Casing. Bill Casing who wrote the book, uh, $30 Billion Swindle. Uh, not desperately convincing, but it, it got the thing moving. And what really put it into the public consciousness was the Fox TV special, Conspiracy Theory to be Land on the Moon, transmitted in 2001. And that was repeated about three months later when everybody got suitably upset about it. And all the, uh, the Phil Platts of this world, of badastronomy.com, if you want the skeptics version of it all, um, who are poo-pooing. So there's a big fight going on all the time. There are a lot of websites which say, who are these hoax believers? That's what I'm called, a hoax believer. HBs. Yeah, um, I can answer one part of your question there, actually. Um, there, there were probably a lot more ordinary people than you would imagine that didn't believe the actual moon landings at the time. My grandparents didn't believe the actual moon landings at the time. I actually watched it myself when, when it happened. Um, but my, my question to you, Marcus, is um, what was the point of, of hoaxing the whole thing? Was it just about getting a load of money out of the American public for black budget projects, or, or what, what, was the, what was the point? I think of, uh, when it started, it was quite genuine to, try, to attempt to, to actually land on the moon. I, I think when it started off, and probably for two or three years, there came a point when somebody would have said, look, hey, can we, yeah, we can get there, but we can't get back. We can't guarantee to get them back. Oh, but President Kennedy said we've got to get it. So they said, okay, well, who are the guys who can convince? Who, who are the guys who can make it convincing? You know, and we go to Hollywood for that. They can convince you. Are you saying all the money that was collected via tax was actually spent on that then? It would, it would have been spent on, on the hardware. I mean, $40 billion sounds an awful lot of money, but how much does 400,000 people cost to employ? It's a lot, you know, even in 1960s money. The money didn't go to the moon. The money stayed in America. It was just circulated as tax money. The companies that made the hardware, Boeing made the um, lunar landers, um, North American, um, all the big manufacturing companies, some of them... Lockheed, who have amalgamated with others now. They're the people who got the contracts. They're the people who made it. The people who built Mission Control, the people who built uh, Kennedy Space Center, the Vehicle Assembly Building, the biggest building in the world. Yeah, there's a lot of money involved. But it was America demonstrating to the world, having been rather soundly beaten by the Russians, that they were the technological superpower. 
and it was all up front. 